asking a question. I'm asking Ravi to unmute right now. He's still muted. Well, Kenneth, while you're doing that, may I ask a question? I guess, yeah, R Ravi's having a little trouble. So go ahead, Todd. Um, I guess this is more directed towards John, but Arun, you feel free to answer. Uh, John, in your description of um, existential graphs, you had this notion of representing things you were called thematic roles. But in your construct in existential graphs or representation in ex existential graphs of these thematic roles, uh, it occurred to me these look very similar to the construct that uh, uh, Giancarlo Guzzardi has, he calls relators. Are they similar to or equivalent to, or that is, are these thematic roles as represented in existential graphs similar or equivalent to Gazzardi's relators? Okay, well, those are the idea, those thematic roles come from linguistics. And uh, they're in linguistics, depending on who you quote, they're called uh, uh, case relations or thematic roles. And they're uh, much, much older than any of these uh, things. And uh, many people who are developing ontologies have adopted them as uh, basic ways of relating verbs to, uh, uh, their, uh, to, their, uh, to the things that are related to the verb, the subject and the object, indirect object, and so on. And so anybody who is doing anything with natural language processing would probably use the same kind of roles. And uh, so it's, there's nothing unique to conceptual graphs uh, or existential graphs. It's just that when I was developing the conceptual graphs, I was more concerned with mapping to and from natural languages. And right. so therefore I adopted a, um, an ontology for the relations. But as far as existential graphs are concerned or the predicate calculus is concerned, they're just uh, two place relations and two place relations can be represented in, in any of these notations. Also important are three place relations because there are many <coughs> kinds of things, especially anything that involves a purpose or goal or intention, you'll have a, a triadic relation. So for example, if you're buying or selling something, uh, you'll even have a four place relation, but actually you can break that down into two, three place really. If, you, if, yeah. if, if I buy something from you, uh, I am the uh, I am the uh, purchaser. You are the seller, and uh, we have a transition where I give you a money and you give me the thing, and so we have two triadic relations to make up this four place relation. And uh, so anything that has to do with intentionality, purpose, goal. In fact, any time you have the question why, you'll always have intention involved, and you'll always have a triadic relation. But if you just have a simple interaction, you just have two place. So the simple answer is, if you're doing an ontology for natural language, you will have an awful lot of commonality, no matter what formalism you use. Okay, well, um, I, Emilio and uh, Claudio are on the call also. Uh, do you guys, Claudio or Emilio, have any views on my question? Well, I'm Emilio. Uh, yes, Todd, I mean, I don't know very well, I mean, uh, John's system, so I cannot really comment on that. But I agree with the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, as John said, uh, this is a discussion about roles, which, uh, you know, Nicola, Guarino, and, and Guizard, they took from the literature in linguistic, uh, cognitive science, philosophy. So I'm sure that there are a lot of connection between uh, all these notions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know the details of, uh, you know, John approach, so I cannot really comment specifically on that. I can contribute one piece of information which may or may not be useful is, um, uh, you know, my, my late dear friend, Jim Disbro um, gave me, he, he'd been working for the Department of Energy, um, uh, you know, and playing the role of energy amp, but he'd given me um, his ontology of relators from Gazzardi's work um, and, had, you know, also extended it. Um, the similarity, similarities between uh, relators and um, themes and um, 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 all of those types of concepts is that they're extremely different to uh, structures for, for example, nouns. Inside the graph to matrix representation, you can represent nouns um, in terms of uh, feature vectors, but um, you can't really represent action contents as feature vectors, they end up being represented as matrices because they have 
complex components that require an action. So that's sort of a difference from a representational standpoint from the just from the mathematic uh, view that we're taking, if that helps. Yeah, and also I'd add the other point is that uh, many nouns are nominalized verbs. So for example, you take the word give and you get gift and giving and donation. And so there you have nouns which have a structure associated them that is basically the same structure as the verb from which they're derived. So that uh, if you have a simple noun, like say uh, a uh, box or a ball or a cat, uh, that those things basically, as you might call them, fe have features. But if you have something that is a uh, noun derived from a verb, that noun will have the same pattern of relations that you would have with the uh, verb that it's derived from. I think Mark has- Okay, uh, Mark, Mark Antoine? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, fascinating both of you. Thank you very much. I have a question. John started with something that was very much symbolic and rooted in symbol, uh, classical symbolic AI. And obviously, Arun has been using that with the uh, signatures, the cognitive signatures. And now you're describing a more purely numeric with symbolic input. But my question is, do you still have, can you still get the symbolic back from this system, so to speak? Or have you totally shifted to a more numeric analysis? Uh, no, it's, it's an integration of the properties of deep learning networks, which are governed by matrix and tensor mathematics. And the work we've been doing to innovate along the lines of how do you have symbols that are connected with the substructures in deep learning networks, and how do you operate with them in a way that allows um, one property, which is reversibility given a set of numerical values, what symbol? I mean, our human brains are wetware, right? Obviously they've got all kinds of, uh, of stuff going on, but yet we're able to recover symbols and we are able to make explanations, which uh, when you ask a deep learning network, how did you reach that conclusion? Well, we would very much like to have the answer, uh, you know, uh, even if it's to understand uh, teaching rubrics where we can say, yes, here are good teaching methods and those are bad teaching methods because of the order of scaffolding of knowledge and information. So, you know, there's a lot to be said for, I think, the emerging field of neurosymbolic uh, research. And that's the area that we are, uh, you know, very active in now where, co you know, conceptual graphs form that discrete universe but when you combine them, because they're both graphical structures and you combine them in creative ways with deep learning concepts in a way that's reversible, meaning you can recover the symbols, then it starts to become very interesting from a programming language standpoint, which is what we're working hard on. Fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the most important advance uh, beyond VivoMind. The VivoMind work uh, 20 years ago did things that still aren't being done today uh, in uh, any kind of commercial sense. There may be some simple kinds of it that are being done, but uh, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the logical kind of representations, that was beyond the state of the art 20 years ago, and there still aren't any real uh, available com commercial applications that are comparable. The uh, great advance that has been done in the uh, neural networks is in the pattern matching in which uh, they give you an answer, but it requires an immense amount of training, millions and millions of examples. And uh, the point is that um, they had the examples where the, uh, uh, the computer beat the world champion in chess and later the, the computer uh, be built, beat the world champion in Go. And yet the point is that in order to reach that level, the computer had to play millions of games far and away more than any human being could ever play in a lifetime or in a dozen lifetimes. And the human can learn in just a, a few, uh, maybe uh, just a relatively small number of games and the learning in about a, a just 10 or 20 games can get up to a level where they discover a new principle that might take the computer uh, a million 
uh, games to discover. So the point is we need that one-shot learning. Humans and other animals are good at one-shot learning. And, the, the, they, and they can also give explanations. And explanations are uh, require that symbolic solution where you can trace back step by step by step uh, the sources of the problem and the sources of the data and how they're interrelated and put that into a one paragraph explanation or even better in a dialogue that uh, computers uh, can, uh, that uh, the, the system that um, Aaron had developed uh, was also able to do some excellent dialogues where you would have an, a human expert in say geology talking to a computer about uh, various geological patterns and, and the system will go back and uh, give an answer. And after and when it finds a question, a question it can't answer, it can go back and reanalyze the same data and come back with an even better answer. And it does this in real time so that it, do it doesn't have to go through millions of uh, training sessions. It can just go back and reanalyze a couple of documents and come back with a better answer in just uh, a few seconds uh, of time. Okay, uh, Ravi uh, asked if um, Aaron, Aaron, could you show your radar slides again? Sure. Um, yeah, um, probably the one you're most interested in is this. Is, is that? Is that the one you can, you can, so just so you're aware. You're not sharing number, your screen, Arun. Oh, ha, sorry. Let me try that again. Uh, let's try that again. And uh, the, uh, the numbers uh, on this X axis refer to the paragraph number. So that's paragraph 28 or, you know, this kind of regular sentence index. So there are 103 sentences in the uh, Bin Laden speech. Uh, in the Hitler speech, there's 112. And my bottom screen is obscured, so I can't read the numbers, but they're all about is, roughly is similar. Of how... Sorry? Yeah, it uh, seems Robbie's having some trouble. Uh, I'm having a me? very hard time hearing. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, do you want to type it in chat? Hard to hear me. Very, then very I poorly. Will I will. I will contact you on LinkedIn. I will contact oh, no. you on LinkedIn. Now Thank we're okay. starting to hear you. We're hearing you, Robbie. Yeah, now we're hearing you oddly enough. <laughs> Go ahead, Robbie. No, are you hearing me? It's funny. Are you able to hear me now? It comes and goes. Oh, well. Maybe LinkedIn is a magic word? Uh, yeah. <laughs> The first time I have such a problem, Ken. Yeah, it's you're definitely coming and going. Sometimes you're good, and sometimes it's difficult to understand. So either type in chat or um, or elsewhere. Um, I think we're going to have to move on. Uh, Janet had a question some time ago. Yeah, hi. A, a question for John. Um, I, I don't know if you read, John, what I wrote in the chat. Oh, but, I just read um, it just now. OK. So and... I'll, I guess I'll, I'll repeat it for the, or you can repeat it for the benefit of the tape. Well, OK. What uh, Janet had written is, uh, uh, as you have pointed out, splitting linguistics into syntactics, semantics, and pragmatics was introduced by Charles Morris, loosely based on the work of Peirce. What does it mean to try to establish a semantic web apart from a uh, 
pragmatic web. Would it be better to ditch uh, Morris's categories and go back to Peirce's full view of sign relations? Uh, well, yes, basically uh, what we do is uh, are based directly on what Peirce wrote. Uh, Morris had a special case uh, view, which is not as complete as Peirce. And, 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 and when we use language, we're never thinking in syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. We are just speaking. And every sentence we utter has a syntax. It also has a, a semantic meaning. It also has a pra pragmatic purpose for that shows why we're saying that and why we are saying it to the and why we are make it, saying that in reply to whatever question somebody asks us. So the idea is that in processing language, it's more important to really look at all of the patterns of relationships. And that's one reason why uh, the idea of a, a graph representation, such as existential graphs, conceptual graphs, <clears throat> or the various stacks of graphs, which uh, Aaron has been developing, that uh, you are talking about relationships of relationships. And uh, it's all basically a huge graph with all the things interrelated to one another in various relations, uh, monadic uh, relations, which Peirce called firstness, dyadic secondness, triadic thirdness. And with triadic, you always have an intentionality or a purpose and they're all integrated and you, uh, and it's better to have a system in which they're all put together. And, and uh, I think that example that uh, Aaron showed of uh, Hitler, bin Laden, and Martin Luther King, uh, they, everything they say uh, is based on their purpose. And the purpose of Hitler and bin Laden had a lot in common, but the purpose of uh, uh, Martin was totally different. He had a very different purpose. And so his <laughs> patterns of relationships are totally different. I don't know if that helps. Oh, uh, yes, it does. And, but I, and I think the issue is that um, people got focused on semantics in isolation, which is a, a fragment of a, um, you know, a fragment of a special view of Peirce's work. And it, is it too late to, you know, shift people's attention to sign relations, as you're saying, uh, in a broader sense, um, because it seems like focusing on semantics um, has been, uh, you know, has led to the dead ends that one might expect if one doesn't take the broad relational view that you're talking about. Well, um, I don't know how, how to get that message out well, I, I think the best way to just to tell people and show people examples that uh, here's an example which does take into account that broader relationships. And uh, basically, uh, one linguist that uh, I think is um, uh, usually considered one of the greatest linguists of the 20th century is uh, uh, Roman Jakobsen. And uh, he was highly critical of uh, Chomsky, who had this sharp distinction between syntax and semantics. And uh, Jakobsen said uh, that syntax without semantics is meaningless. And he insisted on showing that there's this integration. And uh, also another, uh, Zelig Harris was, the, was Chomsky's uh, teacher, uh, his thesis advisor at the University of Pennsylvania. And he had, the, Harris is the one who had the first idea of transformational grammars. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Chomsky uh, just sort of bypassed him and ignored him completely. But uh, Harris had a lot of good ideas. And one of the things that he emphasized is that empathy is extremely important in understanding uh, a, con a conversation with other people. That if you want to understand somebody's what somebody says, you have to think in the same point of view and terms that they are. Uh, if you are uh, trying to understand what they wrote, you have to uh, get into that same framework, that same frame of mind to see where they're coming from. And that's one of the reasons, in fact, doesn't matter whether you're trying to understand Hitler or understand Martin Luther King, uh, you have to know what is their underlying goal and purpose. And uh, in effect, uh, you might not want to be, have much empathy with Hitler, but uh, on the other hand, you really have to 
see what where they're coming from in order to interpret what they're saying. Right, and I guess the complementary point to that is um, what you and Aaron are working on is that what the, the machine is good at doing what the machine is good at doing and the people are good at doing what they're good at doing and uh, the idea of substituting, um, you know, getting the people out of the picture was a uh, misguided notion, whereas you can do so much more with uh, the kind of direction that you guys have been going. Yes. In fact, one of the things that I would emphasize, I, I think I say that in some of the slides in the, uh, in the current sl uh, set of slides, that would be in section six. The point is that uh, uh, in order to understand somebody, it's very important to have a dialogue. Be and it's also important that the computer should be able to ask a question of the human because the people understand these issues much, much better than any computer uh, ever could. And so the thing that the, the hardest thing for the computer to have is empathy. And uh, that's a point that Zelig Harris uh, emphasized is empathy. You need that empathy in order to understand someone. And the computer is not very good at empathy. It's not very good at understanding a joke, for example. It can't understand the point of a joke. It can understand the pattern of relationships, but it doesn't know why. And this is why uh, if you want to have a computer okay, that... You can send Daddy on, Gene. Okay, Pardon? good. Then why don't we... Go ahead, John. Well, I, I, what, what was that question? So, somebody asked a question I couldn't... Anyway, the point is that you need to have that empathy and you need that purpose. And that's where a dialogue with the computer is very important because the computer should always be able to ask a question. So for example, uh, if you have a humorous thing, the computer always misses the point of a joke. And so it should be able to ask a question and say, I don't see why that's funny. And so the, uh, the human can ex explain the joke. Now, when you explain the joke, all the all the humor disappears, but at least the computer would be able to see why human beings find that humorous and it could uh, store a pattern of humor patterns, for example, or another sort of thing is a threat that you want the computer not only to recognize the point of a joke, you also want it to recognize the point of a threat. So you don't know why uh, when Hitler made some sort of a statement that that happened to be a threat. And that's also another kind of thing why you want to have a dialogue where the computer can ask the humans uh, to interpret the uh, purpose and in order for it to build up its patterns of what kinds of things are humorous, what kinds of things are threatening. So, Janet, you also had a question for Aaron? Um, right, the, um, so the uh, Disco Cat quantum natural language processing, I haven't, I um, really followed it, but I um, had enough sense of a flavor of it that it reminded me of what you were talking about. And I don't know if, you know, their focus on quantum natural language processing. Um, I know that they say that it's partly because it, they, their theory of meaning was inspired by thinking about uh, teleportation, um, but, and maybe also because they can get good funding by um, promising uh, that once they implemented it on a quantum computer, it will have significant benefits. But um, maybe if, if you could say something about, is there a relationship, um, if so what? Sure, I mean, so there is a very deep relationship between graph theory, uh, they're bridging relationships between graph theory um, and quantum theory. Um, and generally speaking, um, complex systems theory, you know, people often talk about, about a qubit as if it's a thing, but really it's a very complex system all on its own. And um, graphs uh, have, you know, what's interesting about graphs is from a plain topological viewpoint and topology just meaning how things are arranged um, that topology doesn't come with a metric. So when you give that topology a metric, you can either choose to give it a metric from nature, which means you're doing a data-driven 
um, analysis of what that metric could look like. And that's kind of what we do when we do the eigen uh, decomposition. We, we take this graph, we have an informed structure because it's got these weights that humans have provided, but you still have to induce a real metric so you can do uh, rankings and things. And it's in the connection between, um, you know, the, the, the proper area is called quantum graph theory, QGT. And that's being applied, you know, if you look at the recent work by, for example, Cambridge Quantum, uh, Bob Koch, who's now CTO at Cambridge Quantum, um, and I'm a big fan of his, his book on quantum picturalism. It makes it easy for anyone who doesn't know anything about quantum science to become a quantum scientist. But it also really is connected to, again, diagrammatic reasoning, because in his book, he shows how you can represent all kinds of things with diagrams and what their relationship is to graphs and quantum theory. So without diving really heavily and deeply into it, um, the mathematical tools that have been used for quantum theory are extremely usable and reusable for um, not only a new way to look at linguistics, but also a new way to think about what is knowledge? What is knowledge if not the interaction and practice of things, right? It's not really definitional as much as it is two things interacting. And so with, with this model, you get to you know, have matrices and vectors interact, right? Because they multiply, they do all kinds of things. So it's different. So I'm, 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 I'm very keen to see what other researchers you know, discover in the market. I'm always following the market. I think it's so new you know, we're talking only a few years here that this is largely unexplored, really unexplored ter terrain. And I don't see why anyone can't jump into this and start exploring the concepts um, and, and maybe contribute to them. So it's a great question, Janet. Thank you. So I have a question. Are the discourse representation structures that are extracted uh, from text, are those, do those end up being usable uh, towards some kind of a statistical numerical analysis between the transitions of the DRS units? That's a really great question, um, Douglas. So thank you for asking that. We're actually uh, partnered and working with uh, Johns Hopkins in Maryland. And we're actually investigating what the pattern structure looks like from the mathematical viewpoint of discourse units with respect to the cameo and vice codes, you'll find those codes defined in the Gedelt project, that's G-D-E-L-T. Um, what's exciting about that is the Gedelt project, of course, is very important for geopolitical uh, posture statements, um, you know, he how heads of state communicate, and there's a lot of rich data there uh, about the world. And when you look at any discourse structure, there's really uh, something that is, you know, much more complex than just an attribute, like, okay, this thing is green, you know, an adjective, and much more complex than just a noun, like, okay, this is a rock. There's a whole series of things yeah, that are there's, interrelated. There's dialogue moves even. So someone like yeah. asks a question, then then someone answers, they ask for more elaboration and they get more elaboration. So there's like this whole transaction of dialogue moves in there. And I think, is that, that's the project that I think listed some of those out, maybe. Well, we, you know, as I, as I said, you know, we're working right now with um, a PhD student um, that's uh, testing out some of our technology over at Johns Hopkins. So we are, you know, we are open to, you know, dialogue, conversation, collaboration, exploration, all that kind of stuff. I don't know the answers, but I have seen enough to know that there are, you um, sort of graphlets, if you will. There, there are subgraphs in these patterns and they're pretty regular when something is, you know, as John said, you know, humorous versus, you know, acrid or bitter or sarcastic. They're, they're, not, they're not the same structures. As my act as good heuristics. So Ravi has been asking some questions on the chat room. And I notice, uh, Aaron, you're not actually on the chat room. Uh, let's see here. I, I uh, let me go to the, where's the chat room link? Oh, it's probably up here. Chat room. Okay. Um, 
Well, uh, it does, my web browser, I'm going to visit it anyway. <laughs> visit website, yes. Uh, no, I don't want to. Huh, that's really weird. Um, let me try yes. a different browser. So SoPub chat. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try um, I'm gonna try a uh, Firefox browser. I just tried it with Safari and it wouldn't let me open the web page. Let me try this. No, it says potential security risk. Uh, let's see, advanced. Let's go anyway. Accept the risk and continue. And it says HTTP HTTP status 404 not found. What? Um, yeah, getting a 404 error. I can just share my screen. Maybe you know. my link was bad there. So that's uh, what I got. Oh, it looks like you have a bad link. It's yeah. got two oh, links. Oh, the, the link is in the, the Zoom chat. Ken, you uh, could share the screen to show the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I let me try a literal copy and see if that works. Yeah, just click from this. the Zoom chat. You'll get you'll get the right link. Um, okay, let me try that. No, nope, same th same result. Exactly the same result. This is weird. Yeah, it, it's it it just goes to the same place, so it doesn't it doesn't. Uh, can you Let's share Rob, he can uh, post on the, on the chat the Zoom. In the Zoom. So I'm sharing the chat right now. So you can see it. Oh, OK. I can see the chat now. Yes. Thank you. Um, OK. Uh, quantum AI ML. Why the word quantum? Uh, so quantum has the notion of discrete states from a continuum of transitions. Um, if you look at different models of quantum computing, probably the most popular model is the circuit model. Because every quantum circuit is, uh, is symmetric, that means the number of inputs equals outputs, you can model all quantum behaviors in terms of permutations. And if you model them in terms of permutations, you can then look at quantum state transitions probabilistically. Um, the thing about quantum physics is that it does not use um, the uh, real number system. It uses the complex number system. And so because of that, you have many interesting properties that arise um, you know, uh, through the, the um, uh, anti-commutativity where AB does not equal BA uh, you know, with matrices and those structures. So it, it gives you a very different world to look at data that you would normally look at through traditional uh, statistics. One example is if you calculate the statistics over the selection of multiple choice questions, let's say you want to interview, I don't know, Celine Dion, or you want to interview uh, President uh, Biden, right? And you give them like, you know, a bunch of multiple choice questions, classical statistics will predict that there's no change in the order sensitivity. In other words, it's invariant. With quantum statistics, however, and you can find this in the work of people like Jerome Bussmeier and Jennifer Trueblood, you'll find that um, the order sensitivity is accounted for in quantum statistics or more properly called um, generalized probability theory in the complex field. So that's really what that is. Um, and it, it stretches everyone's, uh, everyone's mind, but um, I really, I really, uh, I really recommend exploring it. Um, quantum effects. So quantum effects, um, you can model quantum effects uh, on the computer. The problem with modeling quantum effects is the slowdowns become exponential in the number of uh, virtual qubits that you wish to model. Now there are uh, what are called emulators where if you look at the work of Intel and Microsoft, uh, they show how you can how you can model um, quantum Fourier th transforms with classical fast Fourier transforms, and get anywhere on the order of 60 to 100 qubits with a traditional GPU platform, and that's more than you can get on the qubits currently available uh, online. So um, it's pretty cool stuff. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, Ravi Sharma says state transitions have corresponding physics, such as change in electron orbit, and it has a semantic in the phenomena about electrons, but in neurosemantics, how will you relate it? Again, a very good question. If you look at uh, um, neurosymbolic semantics, the question is really a research question of how do you embody or embed, right? How do you embed symbols in the invariant properties of a manifold that's inherently dynamic? So think of um, the eddies and currents, you know, where water is swirling in a river, right? Um, <laughs> that pattern is entirely dynamic. So from the point of view of the water molecule, um, it's moving. But from the point of view of the observer, um, there is a pattern. And so that pattern is what becomes important. I don't know if that notion of pattern has a large enough set of innumerable um, you know, versions that it can cover any ontological concept that we can you know, invent, but it's an interesting exploration. Uh, okay, did I answer all the questions? were a few a little earlier. Uh, maybe, yeah. Um, How do you, did you choose the 22 columns and rows? Oh, sure. Um, so we basically decided that, you know, every sentence should be its own subunit of a text. So we didn't, you know, uh, and when you go to a subunit of a text, then every word forms its own sub matrix. And what you get is what's called a supra adjacency matrix, where every matrix entry is a matrix entry and its individual components are cross connected. So, for example, if you take, um, you know, a, a sentence, like the first sentence, like John likes to run, and the sex, and then the second sentence is uh, Mary likes Bobby. Right? The word likes will be common but you'll have two separate matrices with a repetition of the words and then links between the common words in them. So that's what a supra adjacency matrix looks like. And you end up with things like the supra Laplacian and all the analogous concepts where matrix entries are themselves recursive. Um, so that's what, that's what that means. But the mathematics for this is very new. I mean, we're talking only three years old, right? People haven't really you know, delved into the possibilities. So we're actually running kind of late. Uh, Did you find that? It's oh, over. Uh, maybe time for one more question. Sure. Did you find that like 22 is some kind of a sweet spot because that's the, the maximum number of concepts that will usually be portrayed in, in a bit of text or was, is that kind of a moving number ever? Uh, you know, I mean, there are small world statistics at play, right? Which is everything's, you know, seven links away. So, you know, calculating, for example, the matrix exponential at 20 links doesn't serve you more than calculating it at eight, right? You get this diminishing return because of small world statistics. So that's a very good catch. Um, I don't know if that's universal and I don't know because again, you know, we're into just the early phases of, you know, having built the compiler and now doing, you know, some, uh, you know, customer experiments with it. Thank you. That was awesome. Okay. Um, reluctantly, although this has been quite a, an amazing session, we're going to have to adjourn. Um, thanks to John and Aaron. They, uh, some wonderful presentations and great interaction. And thanks to all the participants who are asking excellent questions. Uh, so I will now end this session. <laughs>